Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's uh, a timely topic, uh, talking about the spread of knowledge and how it is connected to movements of populations and movement and, and, and migrations. And uh, as the first speaker, I think uh, my job will be to give a sort of a bigger picture, sort of historical, um, historical background, because after all, the history of the world, the starting of, the, of humanity, starting maybe 100,000 years ago, even 50,000 years ago, it's a story of people moving, uh, a moving of populations, moving from out of Africa, moving all over. And more recently, of course, so we, have, uh, uh, we have big flows of populations so going to the new world, coming, coming right here. So this uh, ancestral uh, history, history of our ancestors, has affected the more recent patterns of development, more recent patterns of spread of innovation. And I'll try uh, to give a sort of um, an overview of some recent research that is, um, uh, personally, I have done work with Roman Wagzer, who is at uh, UCLA. So most of what I'm, I'm going to uh, speak about now is going to be based on my work with Roman, uh, in particular, uh, uh, two or three more recent papers. But this is part of our research agenda, but it's part of a much broader agenda uh, about, uh, let's see, how do I, yeah, uh, about uh, deeply rooted factors in, um, in development uh, and, um, and in economics. Now, when we talk about deeply rooted factors in deep history, of course, there's always some reason for concern, because we say, oh, there is a strong correlation between deep historical factors that go back uh, hundreds, sometimes even thousands of years. Um, people have worked on the, legal, the legacy of colonialism, but even pre-colonial traits and institutions uh, might uh, matter. And then, uh, and then we have this question. If the past cast a long shadow uh, on the current outcomes, how can we get out of this straitjacket of history? Uh, 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 are we to be concerned about historical determinism? Maybe what happened a few hundred years ago is determining why some countries are rich and poor today. Now, the reason why sometimes uh, uh, one could be uh, pessimistic in a way that I don't think is warranted, in fact, by the data, is because uh, a lot of research has focused on direct effects. So you inherit some traits from past history or from, or from, from, uh, from past, uh, from past uh, societies, and then, uh, and then you're stuck with those. But I would say that if, uh, instead, of focusing, sorry, instead of focusing on um, direct effects, we focus on barriers, it's a more hopeful way to consider, um, to consider the legacy of history. It becomes a sort of a half a full, half empty glass, in the sense that there are barriers to the diffusion of knowledge, and they are deeply rooted. They are based on past uh, history, and, as, and very often on, uh, on ancestral traits. But they are not permanent and immutable. It's something that can change. And I will show you uh, some examples of you know, how by measuring some specific ancestral barriers and uh, looking at their effects, so we can see both how they matter, they have matter, but also how they stop mattering and, uh, and they were overcome. Uh, and um, and so, so in a way, this, I would think, also opens us some uh, more room for policies, policies that will help us to overcome uh, barriers. And in these policies, the movements of population, the movements of migrants, the fact that population can learn from people that are not directly related to themselves, I think is an important mechanism. Uh, so, so, there is a, the, so we'll emphasize long-term historical barriers uh, between populations and the fact that more divergent is the historical paths of different populations, the greater the barriers when one population uh, comes up with some innovation, or it could be the Industrial Revolution, could be some uh, new behavior in fertility, uh, and, then, uh, and then the spread of this innovation depends on how far or uh, close different populations are in, in terms of these ancestral dimensions, but then eventually, uh, historically, most of these barriers have been overcome. Uh, as I will show in, um, sorry, I will show in, um, in three examples. So first I will briefly say something about measuring ancestral barriers, how we can measure these ancestral barriers. Then I will uh, show very briefly three examples that are based on uh, three different papers that we, we, Roman and I have, have written recently. One about the spread of technologies, where we have worked in fact for a longer time and we have you know, older papers about it. The spread of institutions, in particular of democracy, and the spread of new fertility behavior, which is, of course, is a major change in uh, historically that just happened recently, the past 200 years. We used, uh, uh, our ancestors used to have uh, a lot of kids, uh, even as recently as my uh, great-grandparents, uh, where all kids, or maybe 12 families, 12 kids, 14 kids, 
and then, and then of course, my grandparents had four, and then my parents two, and I have only one child. So it's a whole, you know, and I blame the French for that, as you will see. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so, so we will see uh, how these, uh, uh, these uh, innovations that come, the idea that now we have lower fertility, we control fertility within marriage, we only have one or two or three kids rather than 10 or 12, is also something that depends on these ancestral barriers uh, but, uh, uh, but in a way that eventually spreads so that even eventually populations that are very far from the innovators, the British in the case of the spread of technologies, uh, British and but also I would say Americans and the United States in the sense of spread of institutions, and uh, the French, in particular the Northern French in the case of fertility behavior. So these are the innovators, people that were closer historically, culturally to these populations, adopted the new innovation earlier, they imitated and and adopted innovation early, but then eventually it spread gradually to other populations that were uh, historically, uh, culturally, uh, ethnically farther from the innovator. And so, so, the, so how do we measure these ancestral barriers? So there are different ways to measure. They all capture how close or far we are in time, really, uh, across all populations are related. We are all cousins, so we can be first cousins, second cousins, three, third cousins. In, uh, in order to cr see how closely related different populations are, you have to look uh, at um, where are the, our most common recent ancestors. So for example, in the case of genetic distance, that's one measure that captures really how two, po two populations are related in terms of most recent common ancestors. Very often there is the misunderstanding that if you see a correlation between genetic distance and some current outcome, it's an effect of the genes. Uh, this is a big misunderstanding of what genetic distance is really about. Because genetic distance captures neutral genes that do not really affect how I'm going to say per se, but capture how related I am. So I'm more closely related to my sister than to my first cousin because my, our more recent common ancestors are um, our parents rather than our grandparents. And the same is true for populations. So, so you can see. But of course, the reasons why this measure could matter to understand the barriers, why it might be easier for me to learn something from my sister than from my third cousin, is because as we are more closely related, we inherited a lot of traits that come uh, from our parents or that come vertically, as anthropologists say. And we learn a lot of this trait mostly culturally. So in fact, uh, you, we have measured now cultural distance by looking at how people answer surveys or other ways in which people uh, show their values, or their, uh, their beliefs, so they express the values they believe, which are very closely correlated to these measures of relatedness, as well as language. Language is also very useful, even though people can change their language. And in fact, I'm not speaking now, and you might be um, you know, fooled by my perfect Bostonian accent, but I really, it's not my native language. I really spoke Italian originally. And uh, so I've changed my language, but still, the ancestral language uh, it, it might also be a good indicator of how close or far the populations are. Now, they're all correlated uh, to each other, and they can have explanatory power, but I will try to understand why, why is that the case. So this is a tree of human population, how they are genealogically related to each other. For example, the Danish and the English, I don't know if you can see, it's very small. Danish and these are very closely related. Italian, strangely enough, are more closely uh, related to the English than to the Greeks, so something that surprised me very much. And also, um, so this is uh, some uh, our population are related to each other. Now, what, this is a map um, of ancestral languages, which we find very useful. In fact, a lot of our research now on fertility behavior and the decline of fertility in Europe in the 19th century and the 20th century is based on data from this map. These are ancestral languages, so they are dialects, basically. So you have Venetian different from Lombard, or Bavarian different from Northern German. And this, uh, and so when the French, at the beginning of the 12th, um, 19th century started to reduce their fertility for complex reasons, uh, and then this behavior spread across Europe, it spread across these cultural linguistic lines. And you can predict, uh, uh, even controlling for human capital or controlling for economic variables, showing that this, uh, there were sort of cultural barriers that, uh, that made it, some population that were closer in terms of culture, history, and said to the French, more likely to say, okay, it's okay now, it's not a stigma anymore to control your fertility within marriage rather than having as many kids as you can once you get married. And so this is an instance, uh, for example, of a culture by a base uh, where language, ancestral language, captures uh, this uh, sort of uh, this longer term, um, longer terms uh, uh, relationship. But there was a role for immigrants here, in fact, uh, interestingly, in England that, uh, strangely enough, adopted this fertility transition 
one or two generations after the French, the first areas that started to reduce their fertility at the second half of the 19th century were areas where there were French immigrants that were teaching basically the English how to do it basically. And, um, and it's not only of course a question of technology or using contraception that in the 19th century was not that was spread, but it's also a cultural thing of it's okay to change our behavior, it's okay to control fertility within marriage. It's no longer something that we, for all the sort of religious reasons we should we should, uh, we should be concerned about. And, uh, and there are interesting cases also where there were trials at the, in the second part of the, uh, of the 19th century where some, uh, some, uh, some activists in England uh, tried to diffuse a sort of uh, knowledge, especially among the working class, about how to have less children. And, um, and they, this, during this trial, the activists, uh, um, uh, Anne Besant, for example, uh, she was very active about that, was saying, you see how the French are doing. The French are really spreading this knowledge. It's okay for the French to do this. While here, we have these barriers to this behavior. Uh, so, so this is a, you know, another instance where the, the, the barriers uh, uh, were also overcome through learning from others. And, uh, and the, uh, of course, in migrations of people, physical migration was important, as well as communication. Communication, of course, at the time, uh, through books uh, or through newspapers. Now, uh, so. So the three examples, so, so uh, the diffusion of fertility transition in the 19th century, I mentioned there is also the diffusion of technology of the Industrial Revolution. There was England that was really the, at the forefront. And, um, and here, uh, the diffusion of institutions more recently, the diffusion of democracy during the third wave, where is the distance, the ancestral distance relative to the United States that predicts the timing of adoption. Now, one point that I wanted to stress, given the theme of this, um, of this uh, uh, session, and I think uh, my uh, the other speakers will provide, I think, much more micro evidence about the role of um, immigrants and the role of uh, more specific ways to overcome barriers. But one thing that we found is that when we try to use ancestral distance to the United States, and we just use the ancestral distance from the predominant population, the European population, we get worse results than if we use a weighted average of all the different groups in the United States. So if you put together also the fact that in the United States there are African Americans, Hispanics, people from different parts of Europe, and so on, showing that uh, it's uh, the fact that uh, the United States is made of very different groups of people has helped, in a way, the spread of innovation from the United States to other parts of the world. Because you can imagine an Italian say, oh, I can learn from Italian-Americans something. Somebody in Africa say, I can learn about democracy from, uh, from African-Americans, and so on. So the, the fact that the United States is a mixed of population, in a way, has, has uh, fostered uh, uh, this kind of innovations. And I think it works both ways. I, I suspect. Uh, now, here's some data, uh, the diffusion of the Industrial Revolution. So this is the beta, for those of you who like uh, econometrics. So these are beta, uh, beta, um, uh, the beta effect, so it's the standardized effect of, um, of the ancestral distance, of genetic distance relative to the UK on differences in per capita income over time. You can see that this, this was, a very, was at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, of course, was not that important because that nobody had the Industrial Revolution except for the English. It peaked uh, during the, the second part of the 19th century, but then it starts to decline. And the decline is as important as the peak. So you show how important it was during the 19th century to be closer rather than farther from the English. But eventually, even population farther from the English in Japan and elsewhere, they, they adopted the new technologies. So that uh, these days, it's, even though you can still find an effect, it's much smaller than it used to be. So this is something that also we like to stress. It's not a permanent effect. The barriers eventually are overcome. Same with the diffusion of democracy. More recently, of course, this is, the, this is during the 1970s and 80s, the third wave of democracy started more in countries that were not democratic but were closer culturally and ancestrally to the United States. But then it spread also to other countries that were a bit farther from the United States. So there is both the importance of the ancestral difference, but also the, the, the fact that eventually they are overcome. And, um, Finally, the diffusion of fertility transition also starting in France. Here we only have the, first, the second part for the data, but of course, if there would be a U shape if we had the first part. Our data started in 1876. It goes down in 1857. But I, I don't think I have much time. I will just uh, say a few things, so therefore, about policy. Uh, this is just, uh, oh, a drawing or? So, no. So, this is a metaphor. Policy is a drawing error. Uh, OK, what should be here um, is, uh, uh, that policies uh, uh, could uh, uh, 
uh, could foster, uh, how can we uh, address that? That will be directly addressed by people that are, by the speakers who will follow me. But I would say that um, they don't need, we don't need to reduce uh, cultural diversity or to, uh, to try to make people more similar in order to overcome this barrier. Because this, this old history that matters, but eventually we see that as people learn from horizontally rather than vertically, as anthropologists would say, across different groups who are not directly ancestral related, there could be a spread of innovations as, as long as we have uh, the ability to translate, uh, learn from each other, and so on. And um, um, so the time is out, so I will leave the rest of this uh, policy for the discussion and um, after that comes up to me. Thank you very much. Thank you.